Right. Hey Sam and welcome. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. Yes. Let's see if I can get my slides up on yes. the screen as well. That's what see. We're all waiting for. It's out of scope. All right. Do we have slides? Yes. Perfect. I see your slides. We see you. We hear you. The stage is yours. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining my talk. So the title is That's Out of Scope because I wanted to talk about auth scopes. But while building this talk, I felt like I first have to take you all through a little story about what authorization or access management is. So this talk will be a bit about access management, and then we'll look at scopes a little bit further down the talk. Um, but let me first quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Bellen. I'm a developer advocate engineer at Auth0, not to be confused with the uh, authorization framework Auth. Um, and if you've never heard of Auth0 before, we're an identity as a service provider, which basically means that we try to make it as easy as possible for anybody to implement a secure authentication flow um, so you can focus on building your actual applications and the stuff you actually want to do. I'm also a Google developer expert, and you can find me on the internet as at Um, We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go fast. Um, but we have a virtual booth, and if you have any questions after my talk, uh, feel free to stop by the booth, and I will keep an eye on the chat there and try to answer any questions you might have. Okay, a little summary. We're going to look at attribute-based access control, role-based access control, and then lastly, permissions versus scopes. So access control, what is access control? I like to define it as access control is the art of reg regulating who can do what on your system. Um, because I call it the art because it seems very straightforward, but once you get down the rabbit hole of, of, of building an access control system or uh, figuring out who does who, who can do what, it gets quite complicated at times. So it's who can do what on your system. Um, and the first one is attribute-based attribute access control, also known as policy-based access control. Um, and like the name suggests, attribute-based access control, they consist out of a few different attributes. The first one has to do with the user. The second one is the environment, the resource, and lastly, the action uh, or that is happening uh, and to which we want to use this attribute-based access control. So if we look at the user attribute, these are things like the user itself, maybe the role that the user has, which of which organization that they are a part of, and maybe even which security clearance you have if you work for a bank or a government instance or something which has a lot of security clearances that might also be a user attribute. And then secondly, environment might be things like time of day, location, of the data, current threat level, things that have to do with the environment, not necessarily with the action, but with everything surrounding uh, this current situation. Thirdly, the resource. Resource. When was this resource created? Who owns it? Is it? Uh, does it contain sensitive data and things like this? And lastly, the actual action. So if you want to read data, write data, delete data, you know all of those actions you usually do with data, right? Um, these are action attributes in this uh, in this system. So if you look at a little example, any engineer can write to any file if we're currently not experiencing a DDoS attack. So any engineer would be a user attribute, write would be an action, any file would be a resource attribute, and not experiencing a DDoS attack would be something that is related to the environment, so an environment um, attribute. Second example, an accountant can upload an invoice if it's during their working hours, and again, the accountant is related to the user. Next up, upload is the actual action. An invoice is the resource. So we're, we're dealing with invoices right here. And if it's during their working hours, then uh, that's related to the environment. And the last example I have is an HR representative can look up personal details if the subject is part of their local branch. So you might already know what I'm going to do now. So the first one, HR, HR representative is an attribute that is related to the user. It's their role within the organization. Look up, looking up some data is an action. Personal data is um, something that's related to the resource. That's the data, the actual data that we're going to deal with. Um, and it's part of their local branch is something that is environmentally related. This means that if you would be an HR, HR representative of a different branch, you might not be able to look up um, some personal details of somebody working for another branch, for example. Okay, so ABAC, attribute-based access control, allows for a fine-grained control over all possible actions in your infrastructure. That's very nice to know because sometimes you really want, want to have fine-grained control over all possible actions. 
Um, but depending on your ar architecture or organization, this might be overkill. If you have a simple architecture, if you have a simple product, you might not need all of this setup because it takes a lot of work to set it up of ABAC and um, it might actually be overkill. So if we then look at RBAC, where the R stands for role. So we had attribute-based attribute access control. Now we have role-based access control. Um, it means that a user can have one or more roles. So we're basically going to um, assign roles to each user that we have. And this can be one role or this can be multiple roles. Uh, things like an admin can be a role, an engineer, a guest, you guess, whatever you whatever roles you have in your in your in your organization, those will probably um, be your roles for your users. Um, and a role can have one or more permissions. And that's nice to know as well. You don't have to have one role per permission. A role is usually a group of permissions. Somebody can maybe read and write and others can only write and so others can do even more uh, things to certain data sets. Um, so a role is a group of permissions, one or more permissions. So permissions, for example, reader resource, writer resource, deleter resource. Um, so if we take look at an example for RBAC, a guest is usually the most basic role you have. It's able to read all documentation. In this little example, we have a documentation and a guest is able to read them because they want to find out more about our product. While an engineer for a product would be able to read and edit all of the documentation. Since they are engineering, they're working on the product. It only makes sense that they can also edit the documentation. Well, an admin is also able to delete that documentation. So in this, in this demo, the admin has all rights, read, edit, and delete. So there's multiple role, mul multiple rights, multiple permissions to one role, an admin. And depending on your architecture, a user that can perform all actions like our admin might have only the admin role, or they might have both the engineering and the admin roles where you either have the admin role, which has all of the permissions. So the admin role would have the write, edit, and delete, uh, write, edit, delete, or read, whatever um, roles. Or you could do it, split it up a little bit, where you still keep the permissions, like the engineer has the read and the write um, permissions, and the admin only has the delete role. And you apply both roles to that one user. So a user that has both the admin and the engineering role can do all actions while somebody with only the engineering role can only do the read and the right, the, and the right actions. So depending on your architecture, maybe your own personal preference, you might um, split up the roles and the permissions in these roles, or you might just give all permissions that are linked to a certain role to uh, a certain role. So if we look at an example in Alt0, I've created two examples, a premium user and it's a regular user. And let's say we have an online marketplace where you can post advertisements for uh, the shoes you don't wear anymore. Um, you'll see that the user has two roles, creating advertisements and reading advertisements, while the premium role, somebody that has paid um, or for a product can create, read, but also promote advertisements because they have the premium role. They have more rights than the basic user role. Um, and usually, if you want to know the permissions of a user, or usually your authorization server has some kind of endpoint where you can query for the permissions of a user. Um, but at up zero, we have role-based access control built in. So if you enable this, we can also add all permissions to your access token, which means you don't have to do a separate request. Um, they will just be in the JSON app token that we issue as a access token. So your API knows which permissions are being granted to that user. Um, so if you look inside of the payload of a JSON web token, if you decode it on jwt.io, for example, um, you'll see that there's an array in there with uh, all the permissions for your user. So no need to do that separate request to your uh, permissions endpoint, for example. So should you check permissions on roles on your API or, or application? Um, which one should you use, permissions or roles? Um, and that again, that depends. If you check for roles, it's usually simpler because you only have a few roles most of the time, while you might have a whole bunch of permissions. While checking for permissions is a bit more fine-grained and flexible, and also it's a little bit more future-proof because there might, might be new roles in the future while you, which you'll have to account for when you create those new roles. You'll have to make sure that your product checks for those roles. Well, if you have new per, if you have permissions, um, those might transfer from role to role. But if you check for permissions, it's a little bit more future-proof and more flexible. So permissions versus scopes. Um, and this is something that sometimes gets quite confusing. 
Um, it also confuses me at the beginning, but if you look at what a scope is, according to the OAuth.net um, website, a scope is a mechanism in OAuth 2.0 to limit an, an application's access to a user's account. So you limit an application's access. An application can request one or more scopes. This information is then presented to the user in the content screen and the access token issued to the application will be limited to the scopes granted. Um, which basically means that scopes are permissions granted by the user to a third party when, the, when using the Auth 2.0 or the OpenID Connect framework. And that's very important. They are granted by the user. The user has to approve all of these permissions to a third party um, so, um, before that the third party can actually use those permissions. Um, so if we look at a delegation standard scenario, because we're talking about scopes and scopes is a third party thing, a delegation scenario might be a user wants to import all contacts from their Gmail account. So what are we going to do? Your application is going to request a context.read-only scope. That's a scope that Google has defined to read all of the contacts from your Gmail. And the user will have to authenticate on your, uh, on your Google services and on your Google authorization server and approve or deny the requested scopes. And it will usually, usually look like a pop-up or a page that looks like this. And Google will list all the scopes that have been requested. And in this example, we'll see, see and download your contacts. And you can either click the blue allow button at the right bottom, or you can cancel. But basically, you as a user have to give permission for that application to import your Google contacts or to see and download them in this case. So once you've done that, the application can import all the contacts if the user approved the scope. So only if the user approved the scope. And it's also very nice to know that uh, scopes can never overwrite the actual permissions of a user. So if your user doesn't have certain permissions on a, on a system, giving them that scope will not uh, overwrite that. It's limited by the actual permissions of a user. So if it's put them side by side, permissions versus scopes, Permissions are a general authorization concept. It's not, it's not linked to a certain standard or framework or anything. It's something we use in most of the uh, authorization um, scenarios anyway. While scopes are specific to Auth 2.0 or OpenID Connect because OpenID Connect is built on top of Auth 2.0. Permissions are usually for first party for your own application. You, you grant um, permissions to your users while a scope or scopes in if it's multiple are uh, a third party scenario um, thingy. So when it, when it comes to delegation, you only talk about scopes when it comes to delegation. You talk about permissions when it's first party, when it's your own application. And permissions are granted to the user. They're granted to the user by the application, by you who manages your application. Well, scopes are granted by the user. So the user has to approve all of the scopes your, your application requests for third-party services. So a user usually has no direct control over which roles are assigned to them, um, which roles, which permissions. Sometimes, it, like if you pay, you might know that you get more roles, but still, which roles and permissions are in that subscription, that's not something that the user can control. Well, scopes limit what an app can do on behalf of the user. So again, the user has to um, allow an application has to grant the scopes to um, that third party service. If you would like to know more about the scopes, uh, we have a very, very good blog post by my colleague Vittorio Bertocci, which is on the nature of Auth 2.0 scopes. Uh, you'll find it on our blog together with a lot of other um, great contents. So let's summarize. Attributes, attribute based access control offers a fine grained control but it's often quite complex and not always necessary, especially if you have a simple architecture or a simple product. Role-based access control defines permissions and assigns them to roles. So you give multiple, multiple permissions and each role can contain, so each role can contain multiple, multiple permissions and each user can have multiple roles, which means that also each user can have multiple permissions. Um, and scopes come into play with a delegation scenario. So only with third party services, but should not be used for first party APIs. When you're using your own API, the API you're maintaining for your own application, you're going to be using uh, permissions and not scopes. If you'd like to see the slides again, they're at access.sambiga.tech. It's a living slide, it's a living document, so the slide might change over time, but the essence will always be the same. If you have any questions, like I mentioned in the beginning, we have a booth in the partner village. Please stop by there or just contact me on Sambego. You can tweet me at, at Sambego. And that being said, I think it's time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so 
you talk about scope, permissions, and speaking about scopes, is there a rule of thumb or best practices regarding the granularity of scopes? Is it, for example, a good idea to, uh, let's say, create one scope to grant access to each operation of your API or That depends on how complicated you want to make this. If you want to have a fine grade, fine grade access control, you can make it very fine grained. If you have a very simple product, you can keep them very, very limited. Um, but the more scopes you create or the more permissions you create, the more complex it will to maintain and to, uh, to check for it with each new feature. So it, it comes, it all boils down to your own, uh, whatever you want to achieve with scopes or permissions. Yes. Yeah. And, um, are there some, things you have in mind when you want to change the, the scopes in your API, for example? You, mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, is it a good idea to add new scopes, uh, remove ones? Uh, yeah, you, you can always add new or remove. Um, you have to usually try to be a little bit backwards compatible or at least communicate very well if, if when you add something new or take something out that you might break existing implementations, especially since scopes are used with a third party um, scenario. This means that a lot of external applications, other people's companies and products are, are using your scopes. So if you suddenly change something out of the blue, you might break half of the internet out there. So if you do some breaking changes, either make sure that your API is a new version or you communicate this well in advance so everybody has the time to uh, implement those new scopes or take out the scopes you already have. Would it be a good idea to invalidate existing tokens so people can start from scratch with the new scopes? Yep, that could be a strategy as well. Okay. Um, regarding uh, roles and permissions, mm -hmm. uh, I regularly see Uh, I work in corporate environments. I regularly see applications with many, many roles and permissions. Is there uh, uh, a rule of thumb or a standard that I, I can show to people who do that to explain them you shouldn't do that or you, you should at least uh, at, at most have 10 roles or 10 uh, limitations or whatever. Is there... Is there uh, Uh, the, the source the source of truth which explain people how to manage. that would be very nice if we had so, something like this I think it boils down to the, the the practices you have in your in your engineering team usually you have some coding standards and you might also have some architectural decisions that, that have been made on front so you might decide each role can have X amount of permissions and if the list of permissions outgrows that role, we might have to split up that role into two different roles, for example. Um, but that's something you can define upfront or while developing if you, if you see that you run into a problem. But I don't think there's a really a, a golden rule out there for this. Uh, I'm an architect, so I know there is no golden rule. Or yeah. But sometimes maybe. <laughs> I have a question from uh, Bruno Trinta. Hello, Sam, thank you for the presentation. Is it a good practice having a scope allowing the same permission as the user that grants this scope, meaning that a complete delegation would be possible to a third party? If you would like to open up all of your API to a third party, that could be done. Um, if you want to only allow a third party to do certain operations on your API and keep the other ones, let's call them private, then you would not do this because uh, you want to limit the amount of scopes or permissions you uh, give away to your users and external um, applications. So it depends on what you want to do. If everything is one-to-one, -one, public and private, um, you can do this, yes. Okay, so that means um, maybe you can treat uh, consumers differently because uh, I often see um, use cases where you have, uh, on one side, the API is used, let's say, by a mobile application with the end user. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you also may have to provide the same services for the same API to a third party, but on the server side. And this third party is some kind of partner and mm -hmm. you have more, maybe more rights than the mobile application. Uh, how could we handle that if we can? That's a good question. Um, I'd, I'd have to think about a scenario like that, to be honest. So I don't have an answer here right on the spot. It, it basically means that uh some consumers maybe some kind of admins with the right to see everything and some other consumers who 
who deal with the end users can are limited to the scope, the permissions of the user. Yeah. So we have to keep in mind that scopes are always limited to the actual permissions of a user. So um, you could have different levels of, of users that can consume your API, but um, even if they request more scopes, they will not be able to do anything that is granted to their user anyway. Okay. Um, what else could we say about scopes and permission? Are there some uh, best practices regarding naming scopes? Um, you see a lot of, of uh, what I use, and you see this a lot uh, all over the internet, is that you have the resource colon uh, action or action colon resource, um, just so you can group them together by resource or by action. Um, but in theory, you could do whatever you want, as long as it makes sense to you or your engineering team. Um, but the resource colon uh, action or other, the other way around is something that I see a lot. Um... And uh, still regarding scopes, uh, is it a good or a bad idea to automatically provide scopes, even if they are not requested? Let's say that I, I start the OF2 process as a consumer. I, I just say, hey, I am uh, here. Here's who I am with my client ID, but I don't ask request any scope mm -hmm. uh is it a good idea to return default scopes or should we usually you let the application request whichever scopes they need um you might give them like the very very basic scope of uh, you can see the the core data of your of your application or of your api but if they want to do certain actions or see other data usually let the applications request the scopes they actually need so just to be sure that means that if the application does not request any scope, mm -hmm. you just grant it the most basic ones or just say, oh no, that it's an yep. error. Yep. Indeed. Either you say, nope, you need to request whatever scope oh. you, you want to be using, or you return the very, very basic one that can read my uh, advertisements from my earlier example, for example. Okay. Um, are there some limits or regarding the the number of scopes <laughs> well again that that makes that depends on how complex you want to have your infrastructure um, but for example um, if you use a system like we do that where we include all the permissions in the access token in the json up token if that becomes a very huge list this also means that your access token will become very big because the payload the actual data of that token will grow very big and an access token is something you that you send along with most of the api requests so the bigger the token the bigger the request, so the longer it will take and the heavier it will be. So it does make sense to limit it to what you actually need. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, it's almost time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Sam. Well, thank you for having me. And I would say enjoy the next talk about JSON Web Tokens. Thank you very much. No. So